Hey classes, welcome back. Going to go over some of the things that we saw last week, some of the things that we're seeing this week. Uh, I thought I'd start with uh, one of the slides that goes along with our notes from last week when we were talking about coral reefs. And we're going to be talking about coral reefs again, the overarching theme over last week, this week, and the next couple of weeks. Um, is going to be the biome, the aquatic biomes, and the health of our oceans. And we started with this picture right here. This is the title with what you learned in sixth grade, of course. Uh, the Egyptian pyramids, more than 4,500 years old. And when you're looking at the rock, the limestone that made these, what you're really looking at is ancient sea creatures that have been, been compacted over time. This is a cool tie-in with a rock cycle because in sixth grade, you start learning about the different types of rocks. In seventh grade, we talk a little bit more about biogeochemical cycles. And the limestone that's stacked up here uh, used to be, started its life, if you will, as rocks. Of course, rocks aren't alive, but started its mineral life at the bottom of an ocean. You're looking at the skeletons of corals that have been compacted over time. And when you take those shells and you stack them up and you put them under a lot of pressure, the rock cycle sometimes, at plate boundaries especially, uh, can push them up onto the land. Check out the next picture over here. This is ancient Greece. You notice the difference in the building styles of ancient Egypt and ancient Greece. Uh, ancient Greece had a little bit of an advantage thanks to the rock cycle in terms of their building materials. While the ancient Egyptians, 4,500 years ago, were stacking up, and when you see the columns, we showed a couple of pictures of Egyptian columns, very, very thick, but limestone is softer. Um, when you look at this right here, this is made of marble. Again, the rock cycle giving the ancient Greeks an advantage in terms of the strength of their building materials. Um, the columns are a little bit slimmer. It's because this is a metamorphic rock. This is what happens when you take limestone, you put it under tremendous heat and pressure over a longer time, you get yourself marble, which is much harder than limestone. Uh, moving on from there, we talked a little bit about the natural cycles. This is Mount Everest right here, of course, and if you look at Mount Everest, it's amazing when you're looking at the layers on Mount Everest. If you're looking at ancient seafloor up here, the limestone top down here, you're looking at the marbles, you're kind of transitioning to the marble. And down here, you've got the granite, the same granite, the same type of granite anyway, that makes up the Sierra Nevada Mountains right here in California. And we've done a lot of talking about the Sierra Nevada Mountains, of course. As a matter of fact, one of the next pictures I think I've got here on the slide, which was, let me get to the right spot here, this. I was just up in the Sierra Nevada, let me get this to the right spot, Saturday. Now this is one picture I didn't take, um, this one I borrowed online from uh, just a Google search, uh, but I drove by this particular road cut right here, this is uh, Gold Run, and this is what relates to what we're checking out this week with the health of San Francisco Bay. Uh, this is an area, when you see this right here, one thing you're seeing right here on the side, which I love, is uh, check out uh, Assembling California by John McPhee, great book, talks exactly about this one area in the first two chapters. But essentially, you're looking at an ancient uh, seabed, uh, excuse me, a riverbed right there, on the order of about 40 million years old. You can see the, the, the pebbles along there. But it wouldn't normally be exposed like this, and Caltrans didn't expose this when they made the road. Unfortunately, in this particular area, the 49ers, and not the 49ers that just got you know, totally destroyed by the Eagles over the weekend. No, we're talking about the 49ers that came to California looking for gold, went up to this area. Uh, just off this, where this road cut is, you can see uh, what's preserved for history. Uh, uh, it's a big nozzle. It would shoot a column of water about the, as wide as a dinner plate at over 100 miles an hour and just spray all this entire area right here um, looking for gold. One of the things that it would do would just cause just a slurry of mud and rocks that would come down the hill. You would use mercury uh, to find the gold sometimes. And as you separated the gold from the rest of the rocks, all of that ended up coming into our San Francisco Bay. Let me go over to the side here, pull up one more slide, then I'll turn this off. When we're looking at the history of San Francisco Bay, the health of San Francisco Bay, we have to know about the rock cycle and we have to know about what went on oh, about uh, starting 300 years ago when the Spanish expedition of Gaspar de Portola showed up uh, right here in Pacifica and looked over uh, a place where indigenous people, numbering at least in the, uh, the 20,000 range, were living in somewhat harmony with their environment. Certainly they changed the environment. When I say they, I'm talking about the Miwok, the Ohlone Indians. They did change the environment, but on a daily basis, their environment was filled with salmon, with tule elk, mountain lions, grizzly bear, 
bald eagles, things that are no longer here in the Bay Area. So let me get to one more picture here. Um, on the slideshow anyway, this is on the way up to Sweeney Ridge. You can see this right here in Pacifica. I encourage you to get outside and check this out. For example, this is uh, Pedro Point out here. This is Lindemar area right here. This is just going up Fassler. If you start where Fassler ends and you hit up the trail there, you can get all the way to the top of Sweeney Ridge fairly easily. And you can see the same scene that the Portola expedition saw back in the uh, late 18th century. This uh, was taken, oh, just a couple couple weeks ago, or excuse me, a couple months ago, but it's an absolutely spectacular place. I encourage you to check out the local sites. But the reason I'm pointing it up in this class is this ties in to the health of San Francisco Bay. If you look at San Francisco Bay, I'm going to bring up a picture that the classes saw. And we're all familiar with the way San Francisco Bay looks. Excuse me for being off screen there for a second. We're all familiar with the way San Francisco Bay looks. But when you see this picture right here, a couple of things to note. One, fully one third of San Francisco Bay has been filled in. When you look, for example, where I used to live here in Millbury, where I grew up as a kid, uh, San Francisco International Airport, International Airport, all filled in land, excuse me. Um, the area around Treasure Island. Treasure Island itself, where the, uh, where the San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge goes through that island there, that's a natural island, if you will, but the whole area on the side was filled in. Uh, really, all these areas around Alameda, down here about near Redwood Shores, fully one-third of our bay has been filled in, and it could have been much worse in terms of the natural ecosystem, the estuaries, one of our keywords this week, being taken away. Uh, there was plans for a dam up here. Uh, the Army Corps of, Engineers, Corps of Engineers, can't talk today, was thinking about putting in the dam and backing up all the fresh water that comes down from the Sierra. I was very gratified to see where the eighth graders, I teach seventh grade, of course, this year, last year, uh, the eighth graders, when I was substituting another class, remembered, oh, Mr. Forbes, you always used to talk about all the fresh water coming down there from the Sierras. They were going to back up some of the area that is now the delta here and make a giant freshwater lake. There was even a plan, if you've ever seen the South San Francisco, the industrial city sign that's on the edge of San Bruno Mountain. Uh, there was even a plan at one time floated to take San Bruno Mountain and literally fill in the south side of the bay right here. They were going to fill up most of San Francisco Bay with just a little bit left for ports here in San Francisco and Alameda. Um, it's stunningly amazing how much we almost lost it is amazing when you look at what we did lose. And when we're talking about San Francisco Bay, we're going to be talking a little bit this week. Let me get to the next slide. About this. Uh, we started with uh, the water cycle right here. I did want to point out the water cycle not only includes uh, rain, precipitation, glaciers, things that we talked about already, but also when you're talking about the water cycle, you're talking about water being pushed down into the mantle in the form of rocks that have been formed, mafic rocks, uh, serpentine, for example, formed out in the ocean, pushed down because of the rock cycle, because of subduction, and then also shot back into the atmosphere through volcanoes. That is part of the uh, water cycle as well. These are our key terms for this week. You'll notice the key terms up here. I'm asking for a sentence this week because almost all of them, except for three of them, we've had before the review. And then as we move on over here, when we get to the very last slide, excuse me, the last board shows the areas of the tidal zone. On the tidal zone right here, can't get the whole board across, on the areas of the tidal zone right here, we're getting the, the, the king tides. You remember the king tides are caused when the earth, moon, and sun are in a straight line with the moon, if you will, in between the earth and the sun. Uh, the king tides are the highest high tides, the lowest low tides of, of the year. Uh, the average high water and average, and average low water, we'll be learning about the tide pools, the animals and plants that you expect to find in each of these levels of tide pools, and how this is directly tied to not only the health of San Francisco Bay, but the ongoing effort to restore parts of the bay into at least a more natural area in terms of the healthy estuaries that used to exist here back when Portola first saw it in 1769. Uh, when I was a kid, they used to teach about Portola discovering the bay. Obviously, he didn't discover the bay. There are not only tens of thousands of people already living here, but throughout California. Uh, the reason I do point to this is, one, we've got a huge Portola statue right here in Pacifica, uh, pointing or facing to the east. Uh, it's right in front of the community center. If you've ever seen that uh, statue, check it out for yourself. And also, 
when Portola was on the expedition that the, uh, the Spaniards saw San Francisco Bay, uh, one of the people who was writing down their, their, their logs, they originally actually thought they were looking at Monterey Bay, but they were talking about the shorebirds and the seabirds in San Francisco Bay when they would all fly around the same time blocking out the sun. It used to be so full of wildlife right around here. Um, when we were looking at last week's notes, uh, you might have noticed, and please do check it out. I'll link to it again down below. Uh, the 60 Minutes special called The Sixth Extinction. And that is one of the things that we're trying to really put forward with all the students is not only the health of our biomes, uh, the trouble that our biomes are in currently, but how do we fix it? What do we do now that we know the loss of biodiversity that's going on? So please check out the online notes. Please check out the links I'll put on down below. Have yourself a good week and happy week 22. We are moving quickly through the year. Bye-bye.